let's now take a look at an example. So in this example, we're considering some unity gain feedback system as shown below, and we want to select the gain value k such that we have a percent overshoot of 1.52%. We also want to estimate the settling time, the peak time, and the steady state error. So of course, the first thing we want to do is figure out what damping ratio this percent overshoot corresponds to. And so we can find that using our equation from the previous unit. So we can say our zeta or our damping ratio is going to be equal to negative natural log of our percent overshoot over 100 divided by the square root of pi squared plus natural log squared of percent overshoot over 100. And if we plug in our desired percent overshoot of 1.52, we end up with a damping ratio that is approximately 0.8. And so the next thing we would want to do is we could, we could relate that damping ratio to a particular angle or a particular line in our S-plane. And so we can do that pretty easily by saying inverse cosine of 0.8, because remember our zeta is equal to cosine of theta. And if we get that, we plug that in, it's going to be about 36.87 degrees. But what we want to keep in mind is that angle is measured from our negative real axis. So if this is our S plane with our sigma and our J omega, we're saying that this is an angle negative 38 points or negative 36.87, which is measured up from our negative real axis. If we want to relate that to how most programs or, or most textbooks are going to be measuring the angle, that's going to be measured from our positive real axis. So we could call this our, our theta prime, for instance. So that theta prime is just going to be 180 minus that 36.87. And so in that case, we get that our desired angle is about 143.13 degrees as measured from our positive real axis. And so all of this is going to be useful if we're having to take a more manual approach to finding this point of interest. However, as we talked about when we looked at doing root locus in MATLAB, we can of course make use of that S-grid function to plot various zeta lines. We can also make use of our R-loc find function to find points of interest. But if we don't have MATLAB available, uh, there are other programs that you can use. You can sort of do it more, um, um, take a more manual approach, in which case you're going to have to use this angle here. Okay, so now that we have that information, what we want to do is sketch the root locus and get a rough idea of where this damping ratio line, so this is our damping ratio of 0.8, where that intersects our root locus. So we wanna look for the intersection point. Something we want to keep in mind, though, as we're trying to find this TS, TP, and our steady state error, uh, well, mostly our TS and TP, I should say, is looking at this system, we see we're going to have three poles and one zero. Three poles and one zero, and so that's for our closed loop system, T of S. So three poles and one zero, and so all that means is we want to be careful using those second order approximations. We want to make sure that you know, if we have an extra pole, it's far enough to the left. Or in this case, we have an extra pole and an extra zero compared to our second order system. So it'd be really nice if we could have those two cancel each other out. And so that just means that they're going to be pretty close to each other such that, of course, if we have, you know, our S plus one term ends up being close to the S plus one, for instance, if those values are close enough, we can just say they're going to cancel out. And it's not necessarily that we're looking at those two, however. So if we go to MATLAB and we plot our root locus, we're gonna see something that looks roughly like this. And again, this, this isn't an, a super accurate drawing. I've tried to do it roughly to scale, but it's not exactly to scale. And you'll notice that I have a few different colors. And so this is how it shows up in MATLAB. So let's sort of take a look at this plot and highlight some key things. So first of all, notice that we have our open loop, our open loop poles and our open loop zeros. So in this case, we had an open loop zero at negative 1.5 and three open loop poles at zero, negative one, and negative 10. So let's come down here and identify all of those. So here's our open loop pole at zero, negative one, and negative 10. And here is our open loop zero at negative 1.5. And 
I realized that I might have said zeros instead of poles. So these are, of course, poles marked by the x's, and this is a zero marked by the o there. So those are our open loop poles and zeros. Now, of course, our closed loop poles and zeros are going to be defined by that root locus path. And so the different colors are representing different paths. So what we can see is because we have one finite zero, we're going to have two infinite zeros. And as you can kind of see, we have some asymptotes here that have not drawn explicitly, but the red and green curves are approaching those asymptotes as our gain increases to infinity. Um, so we have our poles are ending at zeros. So we have this blue curve. So we start here and as our gain is increasing, we're moving along this blue curve. So we get something that looks like this. And then as our gain is going to infinity, this blue curve is approaching this finite zero here. So similarly, we have this green path starting at this closed, or sorry, this open loop zero and our closed loop, uh, sorry, open loop pole and our closed loop pole is moving along that green path like this. And then finally, we have our third closed loop pole, which is starting at this open loop pole location and moving in this direction along our red path. And so we're kind of going to use that to keep track of what's going on. Uh, and so ultimately then what we can see is we're interested in points where our root locus is intersecting this zeta equals 0.8 line. So that's our damping ratio of interest. And so what we see is there are three points of interest. We have one point here. So let's call this point P1 and that would correspond to poles P1. We have this point here, let's call that P2. And we have this point here, which we'll call P3. So now the question becomes which one of these three is going to be most suitable for our problem. Um, so we're, we're looking at, so let's go back to our example. So we want to find, we want this particular percent overshoot and at that point we want to estimate TS, TP and steady state error. So all three of these points are going to give us, you know, that damping ratio of 0.8. However, if we're using the second order equations, uh, which we did to get that damping ratio, we want to make sure that the assumptions about our zeros and higher order poles are satisfied. So let's investigate these three points a little closer. So I'm going to write some data here that comes from the program. And as a good exercise, you could go through and you could plot and investigate this root locus by yourself. So our three sort of cases of interest. So let's say we have our cases here, and this is going to be case one, two and three, and that's going to correspond to our dominant poles. So let's say we have our dominant poles here, or we'll just call them poles, and then we'll say we have a third pole. Uh, so now note for each of these, of course, we're gonna have some complex conjugate, right? So for P1, there's gonna be some corresponding P1 down here. Uh, for P2, there's gonna be some corresponding P2, and for P3, there's gonna be some corresponding pole down here, so there's always they're always going to be appearing in complex conjugates uh, when we're off of the real axis like that. So for the case of P1, that sort of positive imaginary part, it ends up is at negative 0.87 plus J times 0 0.66. And the gain at that point is going to be 7.36. Okay. Um, and of course, again, we have that complex conjugate, um, but we're not really interested in that. So for pole two, that's at negative 1.19 plus J 0 0.90. So those are the two points sort of on that little almost egg shape area in our blue curve. Our gain at that point K is 12.79. Then finally for our third one, we're at negative 4.6 plus J 3.45. And our gain associated with that is 39.64. So keeping in mind that all of this information is coming from MATLAB, from our program. So again, as a good exercise, you can verify that. Okay, so now what we want to do is, you know, of course we have poll information, but we wanna make sure, we wanna sort of check each of these to see if our our approximation of using second order equations is appropriate. So let's add sort of some more information here. So let's look at our third pole location. 
And then we can also go ahead and we can calculate our settling time in seconds and we can calculate our peak time in seconds. So we can use those equations for any of these cases. It's just obviously in some cases it's not going to give us a reasonable value. And so as we're doing that settling time, remember we're going to say Ts is equal to 4 over zeta omega n, which really we said is just 4 over the magnitude of our real part. And for our peak time, we're going to say our peak time is equal to pi over omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And we can simplify if we're looking at the root locus and say that's just pi over our imaginary part. And to be more general, we could say magnitude of the imaginary part. Okay, so let's first of all talk about this third pole information. So our third pole for this first case it ends up is at negative 9.25. So let's take a look on our plot what that represents. So we're saying if, we're, if we have pole here at P1, we have our second one as a complex conjugate here, and our third pole is roughly here at negative 9.25. And so what we see is that's not going to be ideal because we still have this open loop zero. Um, this pole negative 9.25 0.25 is five times further to the left, so that's good, but we still have that zero that you know is going to give us issues if we're using that second order equation. However, we can go ahead and we can sort of plug into these equations here, and if we do that, we end up with a settling time of 4.60 seconds and a peak time of 4.75 seconds. Okay, so let's move on to our second point. So for our second point, again from our program in MATLAB or whatever code we're using, we get that this third pole is at negative 8.61. And so you can find this manually too, but it's, it's obviously a lot easier to do in the program. And so what we're saying now is that we have P2 and its complex conjugate, and our third pole is roughly here at negative 8.61. So again, you know, we're, we're still five times further left with that third pole, but we still have this issue of this open loop zero that we we're not addressing. So let's take a look. Well, we can go ahead and calculate our TS and TP, uh, even though we know our second order approximation criteria is not being met. So our TS ends up being 3.36 seconds. Our TP ends up being 3.49 seconds. So now finally for our case three, if we look at where that third pole is, it turns out it's at negative 1.80. So let's take a look at that. So now we're saying we have our P3 and its complex conjugate, and now we have this third pole at negative 1.80, so somewhere right in here. And so in this case, we finally have what we want. So we're no longer concerned with where that third pole is in terms of being further left because it's close enough to that open loop zero, such that the two are going to cancel out in that G of S equation or really our T of S equation to be more exact. Um, and so then we just have the two dominant poles given by P3 and its complex conjugate. So in this case, we would say our second order approximation conditions are satisfied. So now we know that the TS and TP given by these equations here are going to be more accurate. And so if we plug that in, we get approximately 0.87 seconds for our settling time and approximately 0.91 seconds for our peak time. Okay, so again, what, we're, what our ultimate conclusion is then that this case three is the only time when we can reasonably use that second order approximation. Case three is only case where our second order approximation is okay and the reason is because our third pole is approximately canceling that open loop zero which is at negative 1.5 so we have negative 1.8 for our pole negative 1.5 for our zero so we can say that's close enough uh, one thing to point out too is that if we look at these values for ts and tp we notice that there's a big range there. So if we're not careful with our second order approximation criteria, maybe we said, all right, the let's look at the first point that intersects P1. 
let's choose P1 and we, we ignore this information about our third pole and we ignore our open loop zero, we're gonna end up getting settling times and peak times well over four seconds, when in reality, it's closer to 0.87 and 0.91 uh, respectively. Uh, so again, that just illustrates how we wanna be careful with using those second order approximations. So the last thing that our example wanted us to do, uh, and so let's go back to our example and kind of get an idea of what we're doing again. Uh, so we wanted to select our gain value. So ultimately then we would say our gain value to choose would be this 39.64 and the corresponding settling and peak times are given there. It's 0.87 seconds and 0.91 seconds respectively. The last thing we wanted to do in this example was to investigate our steady state error. So from steady state error, we're considering our G of S. So let's say steady state error. And so we want to look at our G of S for this unity feedback system to figure out our system type. So coming back up here to G of S, we notice we have one pure integration or we have S to the power of one in the denominator. And so what that tells us is we have a type one system. So we have type one and so our relevant static error constant for a type one system is KV. And so we know KV was defined as the limit as S goes to zero of S times G of S. And so the S is gonna cancel out with the S in the denominator and we're gonna end up with K times 1.5 divided by one times 10. Now, what do we plug in for our gain value? Well, we're just gonna plug in this value that we had for our answer in the previous part, our 39.64. So we have 39.64 times 1.5 divided by one times 10. And if we plug that in, we get approximately 5.9 for our KV. So now keep in mind that our steady state error is just going to be one divided by KV. So we find that that is approximately 0 0.169. So that would be our steady state error. Okay, so I know that was a long example, but let's sort of take a step back and consider what we've done. So we've chosen a certain gain to give us a desired percent overshoot using this root locus. But note that by choosing our pole to be at P3, we have some fixed imaginary part which means we're going to have a fixed peak time. So let's say fixed TP. So remember we just calculated TP after setting gain. And we also have some fixed real part, which means we're going to have some fixed settling time, TS. So by choosing our zeta or our percent overshoot, we fixed our other two parameters. And obviously that's not always ideal. So in the next unit, we're gonna come back to this problem and say, how can we actually move our root locus around a little bit in order to be able to specify more than just one operating characteristic?